the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. Yes. Praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts. Yes. Praise him sun and moon, praise him all stars of light. Praise him highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. Yes. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters in all depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. Amen. For his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and the heaven. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song in his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Yes. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Let the godly ones exult in his glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God in his sanctuary. Yes. Praise him in a mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray. Father, we are here today to sing of your worth, to sing of your praise, to exult in you. Father, when we think rightly as your creatures, we realize that, Father, you're everything that we have. We have nothing that is not found in you. Father, heaven will only be heaven because you are there. Heaven will be heaven, Father, because we will see you face to face. Heaven will be heaven because our faith will end in sight and we will see the God who spoke and created all that there is. And Father, the Bible reminds us, the dead do not praise you. But Father, we're not dead today. I pray we're not dead spiritually. We are alive and we have the opportunity to sing and pray and listen to your word and say that you are the Lord our God. And besides you, there is none other. And you're worthy of all power and glory and praise and honor. And to that, in Christ's name, the people of God gave a resounding amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it's so good to be here today. I know we have a lot of people traveling, but we're glad you're here. We also have a lot of guests here today. One of them sitting on the front row, Brother Tony Brooks. Good. 
So to the rest of our, our guests, along with our staff member, Tony, I'd like to ask you to do something for us in all seriousness. If you're here today and you're a guest on your worship bulletin, then the guys can go ahead and come forward. On the right-hand side of your worship bulletin, there's a tab that provides a place for you to fill a little information out about yourself. If you would do that, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate when, you, uh, when the ushers come by. That would be your gift to us, and, and we would be very appreciative. We are glad that you're here today, and we have prayed for you, and it's our prayer that if you're a guest at Bel Air today, no matter what brought you here, it's our prayer that along with us that you encounter the living God, and because you encountered the living God, you leave here blessed. Now, these guys here that are standing here, and the young man up in the balcony as well, they'd like to give you a guest if you're here. I mean, a gift. If you're here, uh, yeah, we'd like to give you a guest, but instead we're going to give you a gift. If you're here and you're a guest, would you with me right now just raise your hand so these guys can get this gift package in your hands? Would you do that for me? All the way back there in the back, there's several. You may want to reinforce him, Harvey. Back row. All right, up in the balcony. Don't want to miss anybody. Thank you for lifting your hands. Thank you for being here today. This is a good place to be. Amen? Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Let's praise Him in a way that He's worthy. Let's do stand up this morning and fellowship just real quickly. If there's someone around you you don't know, turn around and introduce yourself.
holy God, who is like you, Lord, that you would give breath this morning to, to us, Lord, to come into this building, Lord, and to proclaim praises to the God of earth, Lord, the God of the universe, the maker of all things. Lord, you look in each heart this morning, and you see our concerns, Lord. You see our doubts and, and the things that weigh upon our hearts and minds. But Lord, as we come before you, may you speak to us this morning. And Lord, as you speak, will we be obedient to what you're saying? Because you're God. And you reign, Lord. Reign in your people this morning. Take the uh, offerings that we have, Lord, and use them for your name and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name.
Brother Andy. If you would, turn in your copy of God's Word to Romans chapter 2. In a little bit, we will begin reading at verse 17. Thank you for Brother Allen leading us into the presence of God. And Sister Marge, I'm still waiting for you to learn how to play the piano. <laughs> we sure are blessed here, amen? amen? We really are. In missionary circles, they talk about things such as hot culture and cold culture. A hot culture is an area of the world, uh, world that you can go and, and it's just like scripture leaps off the pages and you see God so uh, openly at work there and people being saved and the church revived and, and the church sincere about uh, taking the gospel. Uh, that is the case in Brazil. That is what makes our partnership with Brazil so dynamic is that God is doing such a work and it's such a hot culture. One of the things that we really struggle with when we return from Brazil is reacclimating ourselves into a cold culture. It is very humbling to come back and see a church, and I'm talking a church at large in our culture in the United States that is so indifferent and cold and people who claim the name of Christ indifferent and cold. I believe as I survey the landscape of the United States, I believe that it is a safe statement to say that never has the United States been more spiritual and less Christian at the same time. Never have we been more spiritual and more lost than at the same time. And I believe you see that the marketeers, those who market products, pick up on that. That is why Christian T-shirts and fish stickers on your car and, and J, uh, what would Jesus do bracelets and all these trinkets that you can buy, I think that we see so much of that because never have we been more spiritual but yet less Christian at the same time. When I was in my first pastorate, uh, there's something about uh, preachers that are here will understand this, but when you wrestle with the Lord over the message and you finally get it nailed down and, and you've got a couple of days to uh, meditate on it, there's this wave of relief that comes over you. I know what the Lord wants me to preach. Well, when I was in my first pastorate, I would ball this entire staff out every day uh, because I was it. Uh, I was the only one in the church, and, and I would uh, turn... Uh, the music on my computer up real loud. I had a Stephen Curtis Chapman album that I loved to listen to. It was my way of celebrating. It was kind of contemporary and upbeat. But he had one song on that album that really has always spoke to me. And the title of the song is What About the Change? You hear that buzzing? You hear that buzzing? Uh, what About the Change? And I want you to listen to some of the lyrics about uh, that question. Here's the lyrics of that song. He says, well, I got myself a T-shirt that says what I believe. And I got letters on my bracelet that serves as my ID. I've got Jesus on my keychain and everything a good Christian needs. I've got the little Bible magnet on my refrigerator door and a welcome mat to treasure on the walk across my floor. I've got a Jesus bumper sticker and an outline of a fish stuck on my car. And even though this stuff is all well and good, I can't not help but ask myself, what about the change? What about the difference? What about the grace? What about forgiveness? What about a life that's showing that I'm undergoing the change. You know, Christianity is all about change, isn't it? 
When you boil Christianity right down to its bare core, it's about transformation. It's about what John Newton, the one that wrote Amazing Grace, once famously said. He said, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I should be. I'm not what I'm going to be yet. I can honestly say by the grace of God, I am what I am, and I'm not what I'm going to be. Amen? That's talking about the change. And as I look around the land today, I see America as a land of shallow faith, even among those who profess to have saving faith. Sometimes Christianity looks three miles wide and one inch deep because America is a land that professes God with its mouth while the bulk of our hearts are far from him. And we really need to ask ourselves a question. What about the change? I think that's why it's so difficult today in today's environment when you preach and when you talk to people it's so difficult for the average American to conceive that any earnest, sincere religious person will be lost on judgment day they, they just automatically because we're sincere and, and we're spiritual that, that we're alright but scripture unapologetically declares the other to be the case doesn't it Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Jesus said, Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? That's preaching. Did we not preach in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You see, some will be surprised on Judgment Day. And some of the surprise the Bible is telling us is from, will be from orthodox people. Now, as we sit here today as Southern Baptists who claim to be uh, inerrantists and we believe the Bible is the Word of God, it's easy for us to imagine that on that day there's going to be some surprise Muslims and surprise Hindus and surprise Buddhists. There's going to be some surprise Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses. But brothers and sisters, the Bible says even there's going to be some surprise who believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. There's going to be some surprise that can recite the Apostles' Creed or can recite the Ten Commandments. There will be some that will be lost. And the question before us today that we want to answer is why? Why is this so? Well, I would submit to you that it's because they were never, ever saved. Because they never, ever got to the heart of the matter. And as we come to Romans chapter 2 today, in the context, as we look at this scripture Paul is in the middle of the condemnation of religious people. And in the context, specifically, he's talking about the Jew. In Romans, the first three chapters, Paul is building a case against all of humanity. And we can, we can give him a high five for chapter one. Amen? In chapter 1, man, he talks about the pagans. He talks about the Gentiles. He talks about those that have no knowledge of God and no use for God. And, and uh, he says that even though the things that were made uh, told them everything they needed to know about the invisible God, all of his attributes and his holiness and his glory, yet they turned to foolish things and they turned the image of the creator into the image of creeping things and four-footed beasts when Baal said everything that they should have known was manifested to them through the created order. He said, therefore, they are without excuse. And we in the church say, amen, Paul. Preach it, brother. Amen. amen. But then in chapter 2, Paul turns his attention to religious people. It's interesting that as Paul builds his case against all humanity, and as he builds up to his crescendo, most of us have the verse memorized, Romans 3, 23. He says, for all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Yet as he builds up that argument, 
Have you ever realized that he feels compelled in these three chapters to spend the bulk of his time arguing about religious people? Do you know why that is? It's because a little religion can be a very dangerous thing. I'm not getting a lot of amens this morning. <laughs> a little religion can be a dangerous thing. I want you to stand with me in honor to read the Word of God. Let's read Romans 2, verse 17. We're going to read the rest of the chapter. Paul says in verse 17, he says, But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, though through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For indeed, circumcision is a value if you practice the law, but if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, he will, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Would you pray with me? Father God, I pray that today you would help us by your Spirit and through your Word to get to the heart of the matter. Father, there is so much confusion in our land today about being born again, about uh, what it takes to be made right before you. There is so much confusion. And Father, the truth is, so often we are willfully ignorant when we should have known better. And Father, there's people doubtlessly in a crowd this size that may fall in the category of being confused or being deluded. And I pray during this time that you would open our eyes. And, and Lord, that you would begin with me, that you would cause each one of us to ask the question, what about the change? What about the difference that Christ has made in my life? And through that, we pray that he will be honored. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I want you to notice in the text that we just read that verses 17 through 24, Paul is going to focus on the law. And then in verses 25 through 29, he's going to focus on circumcision. You see, he does that because possession of the law and circumcision were considered the most distinguishing mark of being Jewish. That that was the most distinguishing thing that the Jews believed there was about them. They possessed the law, and they had circumcision. And therein, as, as I hope that we see, therein lied the problem. Now today, as we sat here, and we may say, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, see, today we can do the same thing. And we can think the most distinguishing marks about Christianity is that we are on the membership role of the church. Or we might think the most distinguishing mark is that we uh, regularly attend church, that, that we do the right things, that we're not really that bad a people. And you know what? If we feel that way, we're just as wrong as the Jew was. You see, Paul attacks the ultimate value of being a Jew. 
Now, the very thing that the Jew believed signified the fact that they were a special people of God, the thing that they thought elevated them above all other people, possession of the law and circumcision, that's the very thing that Paul attacks. And his point is that the Jew does the same thing that they condemn the Gentile for. And therefore, they are subject to God's judgment just like the Gentile is. So in today's text, Paul, you see what he's doing, he's anticipating the charge uh, that he is ignoring the special place that the Jew have before God. So without diminishing entirely the Jew's privileges, Paul insists that God's blessing to Israel did not in and of themselves bring rescue from divine judgment, that it takes more than that. I want you to notice as we get into this text that we read, I want you to just look at verse 6 and notice verse 13. And notice how in both places Paul has already pointed out that obedience to God's word, not just knowing God's word, is what matters in the judgment. Notice verse 6. He says in verse 6, David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness. I'm sorry, chapter 4. Let me go to verse 6 of chapter 2. Notice what he says. He says, verse 6, who will render to each person according to his deeds. And then in verse 13, he says, for it's not the hearer of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law. So Paul has already began this challenge that it's not just knowing God's word, it's obedience to God's word. And his point is to the Jew, you have fallen short just like the Gentile has fallen short, fallen short and that religion alone will not save you. So I want us to look at two things in this text today. The first thing I want us to look at in verses 17 through 24 is that God, I want us to see God's warning about false confidence in religious heritage. In religious heritage. You see, Paul begins his challenge on the Jews' spiritual status by letting us overhear this debate with a hypothetical yet representative Jew. Paul's anticipating what they say. They're going to say, well, Paul, you don't understand. We have the law of God. We are the nation of Israel. We are the ethnic heritage of Jew. But notice Paul says in verse 17, he says, but if you... Now, in the Greek, that, that tense of the... Uh, pronoun you is in the second person singular and what that means is that this applies to us personally you see this isn't a them out there issue it is a us in here issue now we can amen all day long as long as I preach to them out there but boy it falls silent when we begin to look at us in here and this is a us in here message that Paul has today and he says, but if you, and he begins with a series of if questions, wherein he enumerates all many of the privileges of what being a Jew curtails. Can I tell you that it is a great privilege to be born and raised in a Christian home? Did you know that? It is a great privilege. I had such a privilege, and, and I was taken to church from the cradle up. There are some here who I, I can look around, and you've been saved not long ago. You didn't have that privilege. Uh, you're just starting out with what you know. Some of us knew it uh, ever since we were old enough to know anything. It is a great privilege to be born in a Christian home. But just like the Jew, the point is, is that that privilege is only legitimate when we begin to live up to it in our hearts, that that privilege alone isn't going to save you. And I want you to notice right quick the nine privileges that Paul talks about of the Jews, nine privileges here. He says in verse 17a, he says, but if you, if you bear the name of Jew, number one, you bear the name of Jew. 
In other words, you boast that you are a people of God, that of all the nations in the world, you were chosen to be his very own. Some of us may brag that you don't understand when you ask them if they're saved. They say, well, you don't understand. I'm a Christian because I was born a Christian. I was born in a Christian home. You don't understand. My daddy's a preacher. My daddy is a deacon in the church. You don't understand. Just like the Jew here, they boast on the fact that they bore the name of Jew. But notice the second privilege in verse 17b. Paul said they relied on the law. If you rely on the law, they, he's talking about the Torah. He's talking about the Pentateuch. He's talking about the first five books of Moses. The law of Moses and the fact that the Jew of his day, they boasted in the fact that they'd been entrusted with the oracles of God. And their confidence was in possessing the Torah, not in living the Torah. You know, today, especially in Southern Baptists, we take great pride in that we are inerrantists, that we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We take great pride that we believe, and I ask you to stand that when we read out of this book, we are hearing the living God speak. The Jew did the same thing. They boasted in the fact that they possessed the oracles of God. But the problem was they possessed it in their creeds, but they did not possess it in their heart. Notice the third privilege, he says in verse 17c, he said, if you boast in God. See, they bragged, they boasted in their relationship with God. Now, let me be the first to say that it's not wrong in boasting in your relationship with God. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, it says, let, let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me. That's the only thing there is to boast about, amen? It's the only thing that's going to last. Jesus said eternal life is this, that they might know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Brothers and sisters, if there's anything good about me, if there's anything worth boasting about, it is that I know God. But that boasting can become sin when that boast turns in to be about yourself and not God. And to the Jew, they became the important one. But notice the fourth privilege. He says in verse 18a, he said, and they know his will. The Jew felt comforted that they knew the Torah, they knew the Bible. Now they were comfortable with that apart from the fact that they didn't obey the Torah. And I brought a very serious question for you today. Is that the way we are? More than we'd like to admit? Do we carry our Bibles in here and we brag on the fact that we uh, know God's will? And this question can probably best be answered by, by this question. Have you obeyed the last thing God has shown you from his word? You see, the major turning point in my life was when I made a commitment to God. Now, I'm not perfect and I'm not an example to be held up in front of anybody. Anything good about me has been done by the Spirit of God working in me, despite me. But God brought me to the point where I said, God, I want to read your word from Genesis to Revelation, and I want to be obedient to whatever I read. I want to quit selectively reading the word of God. I don't want to say amen to the part that blesses me and kind of hide my eyes and say, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that part. The Jew did that, but they boasted on that they knew God's word. But notice the fifth privilege, verse 18b. They, he said they approved the things that are essential. They, they, they approved what was superior. They knew what really, really mattered. They knew what was really important. Why, they were far more knowledgeable about the Word of God than those ignorant Gentiles. Sometimes we do that when we're on the streets of Gulfport and we see people that don't know God acting so ignorantly, don't we? We feel this air of superiority that we know God's will far better than they. But notice, the, uh, we'll combine the sixth and the seventh privilege uh, because they are similar, but the sixth privilege in verse 19a, he says, you are a guide to the blind. And then in 19b, he says, I like to those 
who are in darkness. And he's talking about an arrogant, condescending attitude, that they were confident that they were in a position to help those who did not understand about God. Now, as I'll say later, in and of themselves, these are good things. It's what we do with the privileges that we have that turns it into a blessing or a sin. Jesus speaking about this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7, listen to what Jesus said. He said, you hypocrites. He's talking to the religious people of his day. He's talking to the Pharisees who would have had entire books of the law memorized. He said, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? And he replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the root. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall in the ditch. Yet they boasted that they were blinds to the blind. They boasted that they were light to those who were in darkness. Look at privilege number eight in verse 20a. He says, and if you think you are a corrector, that would be an instructor of the foolish. And the foolish here is referring to the Gentiles because of their lack of knowledge about God that the Gentiles inevitably always fell into the wrong forms of worship, into the wrong rituals, into the wrong pattern of behavior. And the Jews saw themselves as superior and correctors of the foolish. And then lastly, privilege number nine in verse 20b, he says, and if you're a teacher of the immature, the Jews looked upon the Gentiles as infants spiritually. In terms of their religious sensibilities, that they needed to be taught the true knowledge of God. They needed to be uh, nursed spiritually. Now, I want you to understand something. With all that background, I want you to understand that all nine of these privileges were true about the Jew. They were true, but not by default not just by simple implication due to their birth or due to their nationality or due to their ethnic heritage, not due to their religious heritage. The Jews thought, if you'd asked the Jew, Brother Bob, uh, are you right before God? They would have said, well, of course I'm acceptable to God. I'm a Jew. I was born of the seed of Abraham. Well, look at me compared to the ignorance of the Gentiles. Of course I'm saved, preacher. I was born in a Christian home. Of course I'm saved, preacher. Don't you understand I'm a member of Bel Air and have been for years? Don't you understand that I have all these privileges of religion? You know, brothers and sisters, look at verse 21. He just cuts to the chase. In verse 21, he asked a probing question. He said to these people, do you not teach yourself? You who are guides to the blind, you who are light to those in darkness, you who are instructors of the foolish, you who are teachers of infants, infants do you not teach yourself? Do you ever look in the mirror is what he's asking. And you know what? We're guilty of the same thing. We just uh, hide it a little bit better. We're just not quite as, as flagrant openly about it. We're just as guilty when we... Uh, treat our sin in such flippant and cavalier ways when we go out and purposely sin and we say, well, you know, I'm just human. We're the same way. And God's asking some of us today, do you not teach yourself? Paul, notice in verse 21 through 23, notice how he's going to ask five rhetorical questions. These are rhetorical. If you want to answer them out loud for yourself, go ahead. But I just assume you're answering to yourself internally with the aid of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, he asks, do you not teach yourself? Verse 21, do you steal? Verse 22, do you commit adultery? Verse 22, do you rob temples? Verse 23, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? 
So what do we do with that? What, what do we do with this warning from God? You know, we need to realize something today. We do the same thing when as Americans in the Christian church, we do the same thing when we say we detest adultery because God detests adultery. And then we watch it for entertainment. I'm going to meddle a little bit. Go ahead and get your toes covered. We not only pay to watch it for entertainment, we idolize the actors that live it and get paid for doing it in real life and on the screen. We do the same thing when we say we detest homosexuality and abortion. We detest infant stem cell research. And then we go out and vote for the people and the politicians that support it. We do the same thing when we say God can be totally trusted. Oh, he's so trustworthy, but I'm not going to trust him with my money. And I'm not going to trust him with my commitment to the church. I'm not going to trust him with my time. We do the same thing when we say we abhor sexual immorality, that it's wrong, that God abhors it. And yet while we profess Christ, we think nothing of living together outside of marriage. And we think nothing of having intercourse with those that we're dating that are not married to. And you see, here's the point. Here was Paul's point. The world isn't wanting to see the truth. I mean, they're not wanting to hear the truth. They're wanting to see the truth. Amen? They want to not just hear it. They want to see a church that's living it. Now, notice verse 24. What a scathing verse. He says to them, he says, the name of God is being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Is God's name being blasphemed because of something I may be doing? Wow, that's a hard question, isn't it? Some of you older ones will appreciate this illustration. Some of you younger ones will just have to believe me because it's almost hard to believe. But in the 1980s, there was a certain denomination. The name of that denomination is not that important. Uh, they are good friends in Christ. But a certain denomination had three of the greatest in the 80s TV evangelists and, 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 and well-known personalities in the world. They were Jimmy Swigert, they were Marvin Gorman, and they were Jimmy Baker. All three had dynamics ministry. Swigert out of Baton Rouge, Gorman out of New Orleans, and Baker is somewhere over in the East Coast. I don't remember. North Carolina, thank you. Well, the winter of 1988 brought great public shame when it was revealed publicly about the moral failure of Jimmy Swaggard. Now, at the time, Swaggart's ministry brought in over $150 million a year in donations. $150 million. In 1988, Swaggart himself had three mansions, three luxury homes. He had a, his own personal private jet. But it all came trembling down. Now, here's the worst part of the story. Swaggart's moral failure was that he was caught cavorting with prostitute. But the year before, Swagger personally helped engineer the downfall of Jimmy Baker. Did you know that? He's the one that outed Jimmy Baker when he found out about Baker's affair with his secretary, Jessica Hahn. And then the year before that, in 1986, Swagger was the one who outed New Orleans' most famous preacher, Marvin Gorman, because he was competition. After he acted like Gorman's friend and Gorman confided into his friend of one indiscretion sexually that he had had with a prostitute. And, and Swagger outed him and ended his ministry. By the way, Gorman would later in 1991 be awarded $10 million 
in a defamatory suit against Swigert because Swigert lied and it was proven in court and exaggerated his indiscretions. But in 1988, Gorman, after hearing rumors about Swigert's trust with prostitutes, hired a private investigator to follow Swigert and found him in a shady motel with a prostitute, let the air out of his tires and called Gorman so Gorman could show up while Swigert was changing the tire at this shady hotel. Now what is my point in all this? The point is the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Do you all remember the late night comedians having a heyday with this? Do you all remember how Christianity and the name of Christ was mocked in the media because the year before Swaggart was caught, he publicly denounced Baker and said Baker was a cancer on the body of Christ, unquote. And then his hypocrisy reigned in 1986 when he outed Gorman for doing the very same things time would show that he was doing himself. He never once stepped down from ministry. To my knowledge, he's never shown biblical repentance. But my point isn't Swaggart, it isn't Gorman, and it isn't Baker. It's me and it's you. That the Bible says when we take on the name of Christ and we brag about we're saved, we brag that we're Christians, you've got to understand what is at stake. The name of God might be blasphemed because of you. You see, God is not impressed by our claims of orthodoxy, although that's important. God is not impressed and neither is the world. What both are looking for, what God is looking for, what lost people are looking for is an orthodoxy in practice in the way that we live it out. That if we say we're saved, that we act like we're saved. If we say we love God, our priorities match that we love God. And it's easy to see ourselves as being okay. It's easy to see ourselves as being saved because we know so much of the Bible. Oh, I know so much more than the average person. And in fact, the whole time we're bragging about our knowledge of the Bible, we have hearts of stone towards God. You see, our familiarity with holy things must never give way to spiritual presumption. And that's what's happened to each one of these men. That's what happens any time a preacher succumbs to temptation. That's what happens when any believer succumbs to temptation. You begin to be presumptuous because you possess all these privileges and you begin thinking because the enemy is whispering in your ear, well, this surely doesn't apply to me. Surely. You see, a religious heritage requires more responsibility. You want to brag you were born in a Christian home, that you know the Bible, that you're a guide to the blind, that you are a light to those in darkness? Good for you. You ought to be all those things. But Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I want you to notice quickly the second th warning. God's warning about false confidence, that was in heritage, religious heritage, but also a warning about association, religious association. I ain't talking about the Gulf Coast Baptist Association. I'm talking about association, who you hang out with, okay? Just so nobody calls Steve Mooneyham up and rats me out or something. Notice in verse 25, Paul goes on and he says, he says, for indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law, but if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. You see, there's a natural twin danger here of thinking that you're acceptable to God because one, you have the truth, but also thinking that you're right before God because you are affiliated with God's people. You see, so Paul attacks the second most perceived distinguishing mark of being a Jew. It was the mark of circumcision. 
And he's not denying the value of the external. He's not saying it's of no use, but he's saying that the external value is absolutely only legitimate when it's accompanied by obedience. And you know, we can put a fish on our car. We can wear a what would Jesus do bracelet. We could wear I've been born again by the blood of Christ t-shirt and all those things are fine and good, doubtlessly, somewhere in my closet. I've got some myself. But that external is only legitimate when it matches what's in the heart. And Paul wants us to understand that no one is ever going to be saved by the external. Now, I want to be very clear here. No one's also ever going to be saved by works. He's not saying that you need to obey the law so you'll be made right before God. But what he's saying is, is that if you've had the right circumcision, you will obey the law of God. See, circumcision had become in Jewish thinking as equivalent to obedience of the law. Just like we can think joining a church or being affiliated with the church equals obedience to God's word. You talk to people all the time that are living in open, rapid patterns of sin, and they're comfortable with it because they're members of the church. And I love you enough to preach God's word. That's what we do when we equate church roles and membership and service to being saved. And Paul spends more time in these first three chapters on the Jew. Do you know why? Because it takes a lot greater effort to convince a religious person that they're in need of salvation than it does an irreligious person. I would much rather witness to somebody that doesn't know anything that somebody who is steeped in religion and is having all this false security in their religious associations. So the Jew of Paul's day believed that circumcision secured salvation. But they forgot that Abraham was declared righteous before God by faith years before he was ever circumcised. And circumcision, you see, ought to be thought of like this. Here's the way God intended the Jew to think about it. He wanted them to think of it kind of like a wedding ring. That, that it was like a wedding ring. It was an external symbol of their righteous Jew and righteous relationship with God. It was an outward symbol that was intended to show the world the relationship that they enjoyed with God. Just like this ring on my finger is an external sign that shows of my relationship with Brenda, the ring on my finger is of absolutely no use if I become an adulterer, amen? The ring makes no difference, and that's the way God wanted circumcision to be thought of. And if its meaning was lost or disregarded, it was meaningless. You see, only faith that culminated in obedience gave circumcision its value. Notice what he says in verse 28. He says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one, what? Inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. You see, it was circumcision of the heart that mattered. It was God taking the knife, the surgical precision of God's word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, and going into a man, woman, boy, and girl's heart, and through the knife of God's word, slicing back the foreskin that covered a hard heart and circumcising the heart. Dr. Barnhouse commentated on verse 28. Here's the way he put it. For he is not a Christian who is one outwardly, nor is that church membership which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Christian who is one inwardly, and church membership is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. See, here's God's warning to you today. Do you want to know what Christianity is? It's an inside-out religion. Do you want to know why Christians that are dedicated to the Lord do what they do? 
Because somewhere in the past, God has took his knife and circumcised our heart. Oh, I'm so glad when God circumcised my heart. Aren't you? Amen. I'm so glad, Brother Randy, when he took that knife of God's word and he took that old hard heart stone of mine and he slipped my heart and he peeled back the foreskin from that heart and he turned my heart into a heart that desired the things of God. It's an inside-out religion. Jesus said, clean the inside of the cup and let that outside will take care of itself. To the religious, he said, you're like dead men walking on whitewashed sepulchers. On the outside, you look all pretty, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. It's circumcision. Christianity is inside out. And you may be here today, and you may think I've gone too far. Or you may think the opposite. I tell you what, I'll get my act together and then I'll accept God. It doesn't matter where you're at today, whether you're religious or irreligious, whether you're Gentile or whether you're Jew, whether you're born in a Christian home or you're not, the only thing that matters has God circumcised your heart. Well, what do we do as we come to some closing thoughts? I want you to hear what God said to Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a preacher, by the way, a prophet who was primarily a preacher. And here's what God said to Ezekiel, and you want to make sure that he's not saying about this about you today. He said in Ezekiel 33, verse 31, he said, my people come to you as they usually do, and they sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. And with their mouth they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed to them, you know to them, here's what the preacher was. Indeed to them you're nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. You see, it's possible to sit in a congregation acting like the real thing, perhaps even nodding in agreement, perhaps when I beg for one, even saying amen. But your heart still be far from God. You see, God's never fooled. You may fool me, but God's never fooled. And one day, if you don't get this circumcision of the heart, you're going to hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. So where is your confidence at today? Is it in your knowledge of God's word, your, your religious heritage? Is your confidence in affiliation with God's people, your association? And if it's yes to either one, it is very possible you could be spiritually deluded today. And you really need to ask yourself the question, what about the change? What about the difference? I've got myself a t-shirt that says what I believe. And I've got letters on my bracelet which serves as my ID. I've got Jesus on my keychain and everything a good Christian needs. I've got that little Bible magnet on the refrigerator door. I welcome Matt the treasure as I walk across the floor. I've got Jesus bumper sticker and the outline of a fish stuck on my car, and even though this stuff is all well and good, I cannot help but ask myself, what about the change? What about the difference? What about the grace? What about forgiveness? Is there a time that you can honestly look back on your life and know that you came to saving faith, and the way that you know is not that you've been perfect, not that you're where you ought to be today, but that you know you are a different person in Christ. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, the old has passed away, and all things have become new. Have you ever received the circumcision of the heart? We're going to pray, and, and in a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. You say, well, how would I receive that circumcision of the heart. It would be by believing that you are indeed a sinner. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or irreligious. You are a sinner under the wrath of God. And that Jesus Christ was the Son of God who came and took on flesh for the purpose 
of dying on the cross for you. And as he hung on the cross, he literally was taking your place. And your sin was literally laid upon him. And he literally bore the wrath of God that was due you in your place. And that when he cried, it is finished, his blood paid the penalty for every last drop of your sin. And that that is where you put your hope. And that is where you put your trust in what Jesus did, not in what you can do. And if you truly believe that, if God's showing you that like he's never before, maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time, but they, it means something different. You can receive Christ right now by simply saying, God, I agree I'm a sinner, and I believe Jesus died for me, and I give him my sin. I trust in what he did. Come into my heart. Change my heart. Make me a saved believer in Christ, and I'll live for you the best I know how. And the Bible says not that you might, but that you will be saved. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. If you're here and God's been dealing with you about joining the church, it's a time for you to do that. If you're here and you need to come and pray, the altar's open for you, whatever God may be doing. I'd like to pray for you, and then we'll respond. Would you bow your heads? Father, we pray for this time of response. It is a very serious moment. It is a moment that eternity is at stake in our lives when we decide how we're going to respond to your word. And Father, there may be people here that have been having confidence because of, they've had kind thoughts about you, that they know a, a few verses of Scripture, that they know Christian people, whatever it might be. But Father, they're lost. They've never given their lives to Jesus. And God, I think now how 35 years ago you gave me the courage in a setting much like this to give my heart to you. I remember that all I prayed was, God, I surrender. I give you my life. God, I pray for that same courage to be given to them right now, that whatever you're saying to them, they will say yes to you. For Jesus' glory we pray. Would you stand? Would you respond?